right to citizenship, signatures are not required. Proposed Amendment 4 regarding the Kansas City police nature is an example of a legislatively proposed amendment that will be on the November ballot. Pursuant to the current Missouri Constitution, voters must be asked every 20 years if a state constitutional convention should be called. If a convention is called, delegates <coughs> propose changes to the Constitution that are later put before the voters for approval. All the proposed amendments on the ballot in November, regardless of their path, must be approved by you, the voters, by simple majority vote. Missouri citizens from different political parties have used citizen initiative petitions for more than 100 years. Former Republican Governor John Ashcroft sums up the purpose behind the initiatives by stating, it is through the initiative process that those who have no influence with the elected representative may take their cause directly to the people. The Hancock Amendment is an example of a citizen initiative amendment advanced by conservatives. The Hancock Amendment, approved by Missouri citizens in 1980, limits the role of government in the lives of its citizens. The amendment specifically limits the government's ability to tax and spend, and it prohibits the legislature from passing unfunded mandates to local governments. The unfunded mandate prohibition is relevant to the Kansas City Police Ballot Measure Amendment 4. And it prohibits the legislature from passing. What is an unfunded, unfunded mandate? mandate prohibition. An unfunded mandate happens when the legislature requires that a what local government spend money on a program that fails to provide funding for that program. The Medicaid expansion amendment of 2020 is an example of a citizen additional petition Missouri to opt in under the Federal Affordable Care Act to expand health care coverage to those as well as blind and disabled adults. The legislature was opposed to the opt-in provision. The amendment in favor of expanding coverage was approved by 53% of the voters. Legislatures, legislators opposed to the expansion argued that the amendment was unconstitutional because it created an unfunded mandate that is prohibited by the Hancock Amendment. The Missouri Supreme Court ruled the amendment was constitution because it was substantially funded by federal funds. Let's talk about how a citizen's initiative petition, like Amendment 3, the marijuana proposal, makes it to the ballot. Remember, there are two main paths for a constitutional amendment to get on the ballot. The citizen, independent of the legislature, can propose a constitutional amendment by submitting an initiative petition. The petition must be certified by the Secretary of State and the proposed constitutional amendment must be approved by the voters. Tonight, for clarity, we'll call this a citizen initiative petition. The legislature can also propose a constitutional amendment. Their proposed amendment must be approved by a majority vote of the legislature, certified by the Secretary of State, and then also approved by the voters. How can you get a constitutional amendment on the ballot? Has anyone been asked to sign a petition before you go into a grocery store? There are four main steps to a citizen initiative getting on the ballot. <clears throat> Step one, a citizen or an organization starts the process by submitting an initiative petition to the Secretary of State's office. The Secretary of State's office approves the petition form and prepares official ballot summary language. The state auditor prepares a fiscal note summary. Then the Secretary of State certifies the official ballot title which consists of the ballot and fiscal note summaries. 
The official ballot title must follow the single subject rule and use fair ballot language. What is the single subject rule? The Missouri Constitution restricts ballot measures to one subject and one article of the Constitution. For example, each of the ballot measures before the voters in November deal with only one subject. The marijuana amendment could not have included a proposal on sports betting. Fair ballot language is defined by Missouri law. To be fair, the language has to be a true and impartial statement of the effect of a yes or a no vote, not intentionally argumentative, not likely to bias the voter for or against the proposed measure, and state whether the measure will increase, decrease, or have no impact on taxes. Fair ballot language does not come from the proponents, the legislature, or the League of Women Voters. It comes from the Secretary of here is the fair ballot language for this November's Marijuana Initiative, Amendment 3. A yes vote will amend the Missouri Constitution to remove state prohibitions on the purchase, possession, consumption, use, delivery, manufacture, and sale of marijuana for personal use for adults over the age of 21. The amendment would also allow individuals with certain marijuana-related offenses to petition for release from prison or parole and probation and have their records expunged, along with imposing a 6% tax on the retail price of recreational marijuana. A no vote will not amend the Missouri Constitution and the sale and use of marijuana for recreational purposes will remain prohibited under current law. Medical marijuana would remain unchanged. If passed, this measure will impose a 6% tax on the retail price of recreational marijuana. Once the petition has been approved by the Secretary of State, the second step is to gather signatures. Current law requires getting an amount of signatures equal to 8% of the legal voters in six of the eight Missouri congressional districts. The third step is to submit the signed petition to the Secretary of State no later than six months before the election. In our marijuana initiative example, the deadline was May 8th. On May 8th, the sponsors delivered a petition to the Secretary of State with a total of 385,000 signatures. The fourth step is for the Secretary of State and local election authorities to verify signatures. Local election authorities verify that signatures on petitions match the signatures on voter registrations on file. On the last Tuesday of July, the Secretary of State announces the findings of the verification effort. The petitioner is notified if the Secretary determines if an insufficient number of signatures has been submitted. Any citizen can appeal that finding, with resolution of that appeal required within 10 days. If the Secretary of State determines that a sufficient number of ballot signatures has been submitted, the petition is certified and placed on the ballot. Here's an example of how step four played out in the marijuana initiative. Enough signatures were determined to be valid in the St. Louis and Kansas City districts. However, in Congressional District 6, 46,000 signatures were submitted, only 31,000 signatures were needed. The first count by election workers resulted in the petition numbers being short by 1,131 signatures. Upon appeal, a second count indicated that the required number of ballot signatures was met. Once on the ballot, a simple majority of votes is needed for passage. It isn't easy getting a citizen's initiative before the voters. Between 2010 and 2020, less than 4% of the ballot initiatives that were filed by citizens were certified by the Secretary of State's office. However, once certified, the odds of passage improved. In the last 50 years, 66% of the certified ballot initiatives were approved. For example, this year, a ranked 
choice voting initiative petition failed to get the required number of signatures, while the marijuana initiative was certified only on appeal. While the initiative process has been used to advance both conservative and progressive laws, recently there have been attempts to restrict it. This past spring, the Missouri House passed House Joint Resolution 79 that would have made the citizen initiative process more difficult. The resolution did not pass the Senate, but it is likely to be proposed again in 2023. If it had passed, the resolution would have made it harder for constitutional amendments proposed by citizens to become law. How? Here's what the resolution would have done. It would have increased the number of signatures required to get a measure on the ballot. Currently, it's 8% of voters. The resolution would have required 10%. It would have increased the number of congressional districts from which signatures must be obtained. Now signatures must be gathered from six of eight districts. The resolution would have required all eight districts. It would have increased the amount of voter approval needed for a measure to become law. Now only 50% of voters must vote in favor of a measure for it to become law. Under the resolution, a supermajority of voters or 60%, 66% would have to vote in favor of that measure. But that 66 requirement would, would only apply to constitutional amendments proposed by citizens. Amendments proposed by the legislature would still just require 50% of voter approval to pass. What are some of the reasons why people want to make the process more difficult? Those in favor of making the process more difficult say that the current threshold is too low. It is used to advance legislation that the legislature opposes and interests from outside of Missouri have used the initiative process. What about people who are against making the initiative process more difficult? What is their position? They say the citizen initiative process has served different parties over the years. Increased requirements would make the effort nearly impossible for most groups to achieve. And as a result, the voice and the will of the people in a democracy would be silenced. It is easier for the legislature to advance constitutional amendments. Missouri is not alone in seeing attempts to restrict the citizen initiative. 26 <coughs> states have seen laws advanced to restrict citizen initiatives. Most recently, a proposal by the South Dakota legislature to restrict the initiative process was rejected by voters. I'm going to turn this over now to Elizabeth Barr for the marijuana legalization. Thank you, Alan. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Zoom folks. Are they seeing the slides? Or they They're seeing, seeing the screen. The screen. Oh, the screen. Yeah. yeah. No, you're fine. Okay. So, Missouri voters approved a citizen initiated constitutional amendment regarding medical marijuana and federal health services in 2018. That constitutional amendment legalized marijuana for medical purposes, set a tax on marijuana sales of 4% on the federal market of medical marijuana, and allocated tax revenue to health care services for veterans. The amendment passed with more than 65% of the this November, Amendment 3, a citizen-initiated constitutional amendment, seeks to remove bans on medical on marijuana sales, consumption, and manufacturing for adults over 21 years old in the state of Missouri. If approved, it would legalize marijuana for recreational use by those 21 and older and create a regulated marijuana industry. The ballot measure would take effect December 8, 2022, that is one month after the election. Missouri would become the 20th state to legalize recreational marijuana use. If approved, it would also permanently remove from public record any conviction for any 
nonviolent marijuana related events. And it will allow persons with certain marijuana related nonviolent offenses to petition for release from incarceration or parole. Here's the official ballot title. Do you want to amend the Missouri Constitution to remove state prohibitions on purchasing, consuming, using, delivering, manufacturing, and selling marijuana for personal use for adults over the age of 21? Require a registration card for personal cultivation with prescribed limits. Allow persons with certain marijuana related nonviolent offenses to petition for release from incarceration or parole and probation and have records expunged. When we say a record is expunged, we mean that the record of a conviction is deleted from the public record. Continuing with the ballot title, establish a lottery selection process to award licenses and certificates. Issue equally distributed licenses to each congressional district and impose a 6% tax on the retail price of marijuana to benefit various programs. Here's the fiscal map. State governmental entities estimate the total cost of $3.1 million, initial revenues of at least $7.9 million, annual costs. $5.5 million and annual revenues of at least $40.8 million. Local governments are estimated to have annual costs of at least $35,000 and annual revenues of at least $13.8 million. Those who favor this amendment say the public wants to have a safe and legal market. The public wants to decriminalization of recreational marijuana-related activities, expungement of criminal records with past marijuana offenses is long overdue. While those who oppose the measure say, the amendment limits the number of licenses to commercialize marijuana. This would restrict new businesses from participating in the industry and give an unfair advantage to companies that currently commercialize marijuana. Civil penalties that allow fines up to $100 for smoking marijuana in public will become part of Missouri's Constitution and would continue to be a burden on law enforcement. And the passage would have, would have negative health consequences. And I'm going to draw your attention again to the QR code on the back of your pamphlet. We have put in all of these references. I don't expect you to be able to read that here. But it's going to be available to you. Just click on the QR code. So now I'm going to turn to the Thank you, Elizabeth. And now let's turn our attention to amendments that come from the legislature. A proposed <laughs> constitutional amendment that from the legislature has a much easier path than the citizen initiative. This is because it does not require the cost of gathering signatures for a petition. In the case of this year's marijuana initiative, the petition drive cost exceeded $5 million. A constitutional amendment proposed by the legislature follows a track similar to that of legislation. First, it must be proposed by a legislator. Then it must pass by majority vote in both the House and the Senate. After that, its path is similar to that of a citizen initiative petition. From the past legislation, the Secretary of State crafts and certifies the official ballot title, which consists of the ballot summary language and the fiscal note summary. It is also subject to the single subject rule and fair ballot language requirements. Like a citizen initiative petition, the proposed amendment requires the approval of the voter. Once on the ballot, it also requires a simple majority of vote to pass it. Now let's turn our focus to Amendment 4, Kansas City Police Code. Amendment 4 is a constitutional amendment proposed by the legislature regarding Kansas City Police Code. It reads the ballot after approval 
by the majority of the Missouri House and Senate. So there are two questions here. The first is, why does the Missouri legislature want Missouri voters to pass a constitutional amendment that affects only the Kansas City Police Department? And the second question is, why does the legislature need voter approval of a constitutional amendment to increase state mandated spending for the police force? And to understand that, we're going to need some context. We're going to get that context from three years. The first is from history. The second is from recent events. And the third will be from the Missouri Constitution's prohibition of unfunded mandates. So let's go to number one, history. History shows that the state took local control away from Kansas City in 1939 because of corruption related to organized crime. Currently, Kansas City is the only city in Missouri that does not have locally elected control of its police force and is the largest city in the United States without locally elected control of its police force. Instead, the Kansas City Police Force is controlled by a five-person board. The Board of Police Commissioners is made up of four Kansas City residents who are appointed by the governor. The fifth member is the mayor of Kansas City. Missouri law currently requires that Kansas City spend at least 20% of its revenue on the police force. The city currently operates above that threshold at 24%. Oversight of the police budget, including equipment purchases, hiring of new police officers, and police salaries is controlled by the Board of Police Commissioners, not the Kansas City Council. So now let's go to point number two, recent events. In May of 2021, the Kansas City Council voted to reallocate part of the police budget to create a separate budget for crime prevention and community policing. The council wanted to negotiate with the police board how the new crime prevention funds would be spent. After allocating those funds, the remaining funds for the proposed police budget was approximately 20% down from the prior 24%. And so here's a graph. So up and down, we've got here, whoops. Up and down, you've got percentage of general revenue. Okay? And the bar on the left is here the initial budget, 2021-2020 budget for the police board. On the right, you're going to see where the Kansas City Council sought to reduce the budget to the police board by 42 million to the 20% minimum. Okay? So, but you've still got this 42 million, and that 42 million was to be put into a separate community policing and crime prevention budget to be negotiated by the city and the police board. The police board objected to city council's proposal and in June of 2021 sued the city, arguing that Missouri law gave the police board the exclusive right to manage the police. And the court agreed with the police board. The action taken by the city council Prompted members of oops, prompted members of uh, the action taken by the city council prompted members of the state legislature to introduce legislation that would require Kansas City to spend more than the current funding requirement of 20% of its revenue on the police budget. So two laws were introduced during the 2022 legislative session. One was Senate Bill 678, and that would increase the percentage that Kansas City would have to allocate to its police force from 20% to 25%. However, the legislature did not provide Kansas City with money to fund the mandated increased spending. But that gets us to point number three. Remember that the Missouri Constitution, through the Hancock Amendment, prohibits unfunded mandates. And this gets back to a slide that Melanie sh uh, showed you earlier. Remember, an unfunded mandate happens when the legislature requires that a local government spend money on a program but fails.
fails to provide funding for that program. So a companion bill, which created Amendment 4, which is on your ballot, was also passed by the legislature. It seeks to create a specific exception to the Missouri Constitution to mandate the increased spending without providing funds for the Kansas City Police Commission through Senate Bill 678. In other words, Senate Bill 678 cannot be enforced without the passage of Amendment 4 it's on your ballot because it is an unfunded mandate. So let's use another graph to illustrate up and down. We have the amount budgeted in millions of dollars. Each column going from left to right represents a different budget. The light area is state mandated at 20%. That is about $193 million. In the middle, you've got the Kansas City 2022-2023 current budget of $234 million, which is about $40 million over the $193 million. So this dark blue is about $43 million, $41 million over the, the minimum. And at the far right, the proposed amount by the legislature, which is $241 million at 25%, and that is $49 million more than the current state minimum and more than the current Kansas City budget. Okay, so now that you have context, now that you know the history, and now that you know about recent events, and now that you know about unfunded mandates, we're ready to talk about Amendment 4. So here's the official ballot title and the fiscal note. Shall the Missouri Constitution be amended to authorize laws passed before December 31st, 2026 that increase minimum funding for a police force established by a state board of police commissioners to ensure such a police force has additional resources? State and local governmental entities estimate no additional costs or savings related to this proposal. Here's the bare ballot language. A yes vote will amend the Missouri Constitution to allow the General Assembly by law to increase the minimum funding for a police force established by the State Board of Police Commissioners to ensure such police force has additional resources to serve the community. Currently, the only police force established by the State Board of Police Commissioners is found in Kansas City, Missouri. A no vote will not amend the Missouri Constitution regarding the funding for a police force established by the State Board of Police Commissioners. If passed, this measure will have no impact on taxes. Proponents believe the amendment and accompanying legislation is necessary to prevent the Kansas City Council from re reducing police funding. Proponents also believe that the amendment is necessary to ensure that the Kansas City Police Force has the resources to keep Kansas City safe. And finally, proponents believe that the Kansas City Police Department should not be controlled by city council, but remain under the control of the police force. Opponents believe that the citizens of Kansas City should decide how tax revenue is spent, not the Missouri State Legislature. Opponents also believe that Kansas City should have elected local control over its police force and how crime is fought, both through policing and crime prevention. And finally, opponents believe that the measure could have a negative impact on other city services that could see budget cuts. And now I'll turn it over to Melody Messner, who will talk about the constitutional convention. Signing me yet. Part of the, presentation. <laughs> the question of whether to call a constitutional convention will be on the November ballot. And here's the official question Shall there be a convention to revise and amend the Constitution? Voters vote yes to support a constitutional convention. Voters vote no to reject a constitutional convention. Before going into the ballot language, let's provide some background. Every 20 years, the Missouri Constitution gives the voters the ability to call a constitutional convention. Since 1962, 
Missourians have been asked every 20 years to consider convening a constitutional convention. The voters have rejected the question every time. Voter approval by a simple majority of votes is needed for passage. If voters approve the ballot measure, the governor will call an election to select 83 delegates. A delegate must possess the same qualifications as a state senator, including being at least 30 years old, a Missouri voter for three years, and a resident of their district for at least one year. A delegate cannot hold another public office. Here's how delegates to the Constitutional Convention would be chosen. Voters in each of the state's 34 Senate districts would choose two delegates in a special <coughs> election. The five political parties, Republican, Democratic, Greens, Libertarian, and Constitution, would each be allowed to nominate one candidate for each of the state's 34 Senate districts. The top two vote, vote getters in each district go to the convention. This process chooses 68 delegates. There are also 15 delegate positions chosen by voters across the entire state. The 15 candidates with the highest number of votes statewide would be seated. Unlike the district delegates, these delegates are not nominated by a political party and party affiliation is not noted on the ballot. The Missouri Constitution is not specific on the rules of the convention. There is one requirement that the sessions of the convention shall be held with open doors. Any proposed changes to the constitutions submitted by the convention must be approved by voters. Remember how we talked about fair ballot language. Here's a real example. A yes vote will require the governor to call an election of delegates to serve at a convention for the purpose of revising or amending the Missouri Constitution. Any revisions or amendments will then need to be put to a vote of the people for their consideration. A no vote will mean no constitutional convention will be held. If passed, this measure will have no impact on taxes. Proponents say that a constitutional convention would be an opportunity to eliminate changes to the constitution made over the last 20 years. The power of a constitutional convention is beyond the reach of the governor or the legislature. No veto can block its work and no sanction is needed from lawmakers. Only approval in a statewide vote can change the constitution. Opponents say that the current political atmosphere is not right for a convention. A constitutional convention in the middle of a culture war would attract extreme ideologues across the political spectrum. Opponents are also concerned that approval of the question will set off a potentially heated fight, financed by special interests, to choose convention delegates. There is a proposed constitutional amendment related to municipal bonds and another related to the National Guard on this November's ballot. Both proposed amendments originated in the legislature. They were advanced with bipartisan support and saw minimal opposition. They are not controversial. In the interest of our time, we did not talk about these measures today in order to get dedicate more time to more controversial proposals. We have, however, presented summaries of these in the audience note for you. So where can you get voter information? Before November 8th, make sure you are ready to vote. You can go to several sites, kceb.org, which is the Kansas uh, Board of Elections, Kansas City Board of Elections, vote11.org, sos.mo.gov slash elections, which doesn't stand for help, it stands for Secretary of State, <laughs> and that depends on your perspective probably. To ch and when, anyway, when you go to these sites, you can check your registration um, status, confirm your address, and check your polling place. Now is also the time to make sure that you have the proper ID to present at your polling place. Proper ID is now a non-expired Missouri driver license, 
Missouri non-driver license, a U.S. passport, or U.S. military ID. Before November 8, get informed about what's on the ballot. Sources for information are vote411.org, the League of Women Voter Forms, League of Women Voter Guides, local media and libraries like the Kansas City Public Library, the Election, the Local Election Board, and Ballotpedia.org. The Secretary of State's office is another source of election information. You can check your voter registration, register to vote, and inform yourself of election and ballot measures. <clears throat> when considering a source of information, we think the following standards are important. Number one, nonpartisan. Two, they cite their sources of information. And three, provides information from both proponents and opponents. Let's talk about vote411.org in greater detail. Vote 411 was launched by the League of Women Voters Education Fund as one-stop shop for election information. All 50 states have vote411.org sites. Vote411.org provides nonpartisan information with both general and state-specific election information. With vote411.org, you can check your voter registration, find out what's on your ballot, find election dates, find your polling place, compare candidates and study ballot measures, and create a copy of your ballot to take to the polls. And now we will have questions and answers. Besides somebody who knows the answer, right? Melody. And uh, Melanie, if you could uh, join us up here. And let's start, let's gather up uh, all the questions here. Oh, I, 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 this, this is the question I love, I love the most. Okay. Do, does the entire state get to vote on the Kansas City police issue? And the answer is yes. People in the Booth Hill will be deciding on this issue just as much as people in Kansas City. And actually, there is a lot of confusion on this because we have come across uh, well read, intelligent people in uh, Clay County who are thinking, no, 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 that's just a Kansas City thing. Uh, we're, we're not going to vote on this. No, it's, it's, it's going to be there. And then during a constitutional convention, are any areas off limits? Have you ever heard this question? Right. This, this is an excellent question. Because if you think about it, or, yeah. Oh, I did. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> you can repeat it. Yeah. I'm you did. Ahead. You did. I'm going to say it again. During a constitutional convention, are any areas off limits? Okay. And so, does everybody get that as a question? Okay. All right. So, the short answer is no. Everything is on the table. Okay. We're and so this is why when there have been discussions about this. People will say, there are people that say, hey, this is going to be great. We're going to be able to advance whatever we want. We won't need to get petitions. And man, we're going to get whatever uh, initiative we want passed. The problem is, there are also people that are going to want that, like the, what we cited in that source. People saying, we want to take everything that's come onto the Constitution in the last 20 years and take it off the table, which would include, uh, for example, Medicaid expansion. Somebody might want to say, well, let's get rid of the Hancock Amendment. Everything would be on the table. So um, as, as Joseph knows, uh, when, when was, we were talking about this earlier, people that are proponents of the Constitutional Convention, they tend to be risk takers. They're, they're saying, hey, I'm willing to put everything on the table. And people that generally are concerned about a Constitutional Convention, they tend to be less inclined to take risks because they worry about what they may lose. Okay. And so, okay. Okay, so let's go to a police budget question. Is the fair ballot language on the ballot along with the title 
Is there only one, one mention of the Kansas City on the police ballot measure? Okay. There is only one mention of Kansas City, and that's in the fair ballot language. It is not on the, the, the official ballot title. Okay. So, um, and this is where you get back to the importance of fair ballot language. Um, and so, um, so on the ballot, as like like as 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 Melody explained, there's different parts to the whole thing in the sense that you've got the fair ballot language, you've got the summary, you've got the fiscal note, and then um, official ballot title. But you have to look at them all. And of course, the Secretary of State writes the fair ballot language. Okay, let's go to. Okay. Um, let's yeah. Let's, you want to do, do them all in order? It's up to you. You're the one that's answering. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's let's uh, let's stick with police funding. Um, are the proposed revenues to be decreased, not designated to be moved to a special crime fighting fund? Does this not keep the funds in the Kansas City Police Police Just Focuses issue? Okay. So no. There would be the quick answer to the question is if we go from a mandated 20% to a mandated 25%, that will not go to a special fund. It will just plain go to the police board, and then it's up to the police board and not Kansas City Council. To do the Kansas City Council can say, hey, we would like you to spend this on community policing, but the police board and the courts have said, no, no, it's this, this is exclusive to the police board, okay? And so everything that we talked about where there was that $42 million special fund, basically the court and the, the, the police board said, we object to that and the court, and, and the, you can't tell us, you can't carve out anything for anything that's specific. So it's up to the police board what they would want to do with that incremental, let's say 1%, 24 to 25%, Relative to what city council spends, or the incremental five percent over what's mandated by the state. Okay, and then our next question that's on the police: If the police minutes failed in Kansas City but passed statewide, would it become law? Great question. Uh, it would become state law. It would become it, it would, because this is remember what what we, is, we are all voting for is an amendment to the Constitution, okay? An amendment to the Constitution that gives the legislature the ability to have a special exception to unfunded mandates, okay? So again, the votes of people in the boot heel count as much as votes of all of us here. And our last police question is, if the amendment for passes, does that give the state legislature carte blanche to change Kansas City's budgets in future years? The answer, yes, ma'am. <laughs> the answer, the answer is it gives the state legislature uh, the ability to create unfunded mandates. They have the ability right now to pass. Well, let's put it this way: it gives them the ability to do unfunded mandates. So, yes. Okay, now let's shift gears. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I think this one, if I read it right. Penalty for smoking. Is there a penalty for smoking in public? And I think that goes along with the marijuana amendment. Understand that the marijuana amendment is 37 pages long. There's a lot of information in there. But yes, my understanding of it is that there will be certain areas that you can smoke, but there will be certain areas where you cannot smoke. And if you are caught smoking it in an area where you're not supposed to be, you can be fined, which is one of the reasons why police, you know, do police officers want to be worrying about giving out fines to people that are smoking marijuana in non-public areas. Is that correct? Marijuana Amendment. Does it have language that says licenses go first to current medical license holders? Yes. 
and I don't want to go through it all because, again, it's 37 pages long. Greg might know. But, yes, they can. But then there's lotteries open. There's a whole – if you read the whole amendment, you can see exactly what happens once it goes into effect. And so this one here, this is when citizens um, vote, how is the legislature able to not interfere and in inter change it? Yes. Okay. So this is this is a general question. Yeah, I think so this is a general process question. And I'm gonna so when citizens vote, okay, let's say when there is um, uh, well, I'll, I'll give another. Let me rephrase this with an example. The who here remembers the puppy mill uh, amend uh, ballot question? Everybody remembers. Okay. So the puppy mill and. Now that was not, it was, that was passed or approved by the voters, but it was a constitutional, it was not a constitutional amendment. It was a statute. And as a statute, it, one of the reasons they may have advanced that statute is it's easier to get um, signatures for a statute. Okay? The, the bar is lower. Okay, so it was passed. And then what happened next? The legislature, uh, the legislature just went the other way and said, no, don't, don't, wor don't worry about that. And they passed something that was completely 180 degrees away from the puppy mill amendment. Okay? So that is an example of a case where the legislature did not follow the advice of the voters. And the legislature could do that because it was a statute. And not, not a constitutional amendment, which is relevant to the marijuana issue because one of the reasons that petition took so long is that the proponents wanted to put a lot of stuff out of reach of the legislature. Okay. And that's and because in a constitutional amendment, it is out of reach of the legislature. You have to go to the voters um, on that first. So uh, and, and, and then I'll give one more answer to this question, we did interview um, an aide to a legislature. We asked that question. We said, um, so when the voters, you know, if they're consulting, they vote on something, does it really matter to the legislature? And this legislative aide said, no, the legislature just doesn't care about that. Okay. So I didn't say it, but a legislative aide did. So I hope that answers that question. Very good question. Okay. Okay, so let me read this. Was the fair ballot language requirement in place in 2020 when Amendment 3 was on the ballot and overruled the redistricting process that was approved, passed in, in uh, Clean Missouri in 2018? Another excellent question. This is, this, 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 you guys get, a, well, I'm going to say, but you get a prize for excellent <laughs> questions here. Um, so the fair ballot language was there. Now, here's the thing about fair ballot language. Remember, it's written by the Secretary of State. And fair ballot language is continually subject to litigation. So, so it's, it's as fair as the Secretary of, of State is. This is why in, in, in our presentation, we said fair ballot language is as determined by the Secretary of State. And we are very very uh, careful to make sure that we were saying that the League of Women Voters does not write fair ballot language. Okay? Be, and, and, and again, it's, there are lots and lots and lots, every year where these things come up, fair ballot language is subject to litigation. Okay, we have, um, is the unfunded mandate against the Hancock Amendment? Yes, yes, the unfunded, the creation of the unfunded mandate is contrary to the Hancock Amendment, which is why uh, Amendment 4 is in front of you uh, uh, on the ballot here. And, oh, how can there be no costs associated with increased funding Amendment 4? Um, so, uh, the mayor of Kansas City um, challenged that. He says that, yes, there are increased costs associated with Amendment 4, and he believes that the fair ballot language is incorrect on that. So, um, so anyway, there's, 
there's a lesson here on all of that. And I guess for, for all of us, your, your lesson is fair ballot language is it's, um, written by a, 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 it's written by a human being. Human beings uh, can, can do that. So you <laughs> should take it upon yourself to make sure that it, it, you're educated and you're prepared. Okay, and so um, let's take three more. Oh yeah, that's a good, good question. We do not. We do not. Okay. All right. So let me. I'm going to do um, one one question here. How can I get involved? Okay. Um, and so, and and you know this is this is what we timed out on, on the screen. Yeah. That's all right. So how can I get involved? Well, you know the league. We win voters. Everybody thinks, well, the league. When we, the League of Women Voters, we register voters, but we do many more things and we get people involved. And one of the things we do is we get people involved on more than just election day. So form, okay? we inform, we bring like just right like today. We are bringing you uh, information by proponents. We are bringing you information by uh, opponents and proponents. The forums, we bring the candidates there. We actually will create the questions for these candidates and they have to answer them. The voter guide, the same thing. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you one thing I love about the voter guide. I meet people all the time and they will say, you know something? I love the voter guides because if I see a, 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 a candidate and they don't respond to the voter guide, I know that I'm not gonna vote for that person, okay? <laughs> so the voter guides um, get out the vote uh, we all work to get out the vote. So, um, and then social media, and, and, and there you've got to the end of the back. There, and in fact, if you want to get involved today, you want to you want to be discovered. She's got a social media campaign that's called I Vote Because, and uh, they'll take a picture of you, and it'll show up on Facebook, and then you can share it with your friends and everyone else, and all that. So there's lots of ways to get involved. The other thing is. You know, politics, like, you'll have to indulge me here. My sister was registering voters the other day, and, and, and this guy said, you know, I'm just not going to register because my vote doesn't count. And she was saying, you know, that's really sad. And, and the thing about it is, politics is something you should not do alone. Okay? You should do it with other folks, and other folks can sustain you. And so that's another reason to get involved with the league because you won't be doing politics alone. You'll be surrounded by all kinds of other folks that, that, that are fired up about stuff. So I'll let, have one more question because we've gone through all the note cards. Any other questions here? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, so the question was, if you really want to know, okay, all of the stuff about the amendment, my, my recommendation to you would be to read the amendment, read it. You go to the Secretary of State's site and you see it on, online there, you can pull it up. And you know, these things are not real exciting things to read, okay? But eventually, you do get to those arguments will come up, and, and I can. And for example, I heard um, I hear from time to time people making uh, doing interviews on this, and I'm surprised a lot of times when people talk about the amendment on either side, how often people may not get it right. I mean, I think Melanie, Melanie, and I have read the thing. You've read it. I know about four times. <laughs> But 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 do 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 read it, and, and and let me give you some guidance here. The proponents and the opponents on the marijuana issue, they generally fall into uh, three or four areas. One of them is uh, the here's the easy one: the people in the legislature tend not to like it because it takes staying power away from them. Okay. Um, 
then there are also people that do not like, then there's this dimension of people who are focused on the commercial dis, uh, dimension, okay? And again, this does not fall along party lines, okay? But there are people that are troubled by, uh, let's say, a regulated market and a controlled market and a market that is not a free, that, 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 you know, a free market. In other words, people, there are people, the legislator said, there are 16,000 um, alcohol distributor uh, uh, places where um, liquor stores. Thank you, ma'am. There are 16,000 liquor stores in the state of Missouri. Why can't there be 16,000 marijuana dispensaries? There's, there's that. Um, and then there's another dimension, and it's the criminal justice dimension. Okay, and there are people that are that are focused on that, and especially the whole expungement thing. So when you read it, it's important to look at at, at those. It, it, is, it is long and it is complicated, but as a voter, um, it's worth your time. I also told Greg this morning, I found a great, I don't know if you've been to Ballotpedia. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Ballotpedia actually has a section on the Amendment 3, and it's like a drop down, and it will ask a very simple question, and you hit it, and drop down, and it gives you a very good summary. So I also use that in conjunction with reading the whole amendment because it made it a little bit easier to see where everything was going. So ballotpedia.com. Just type in the question and that might come up. Dot org. I'm sorry. Okay, we got time for one more question. One, one five. So thank you. Oh, 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 And this is on vote four one one dot yeah. All right. Okay. It's great. All right. Thank you very much. You've been a wonderful audience. And I, I just wanted to say the last day to register to vote for the November election is October twelfth. So Anne is sitting over here and would love to get you registered if you're not. And if you have friends, let them know uh, to register by October twelfth. And then Judy Ann might know. Judy Ann, yeah. Okay, uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Excellent question. So, um, here, let me. Oh, exactly. And so, I had a conversation with Anne about this. Do it from heart and, and Ann's going to back me up. So, <clears throat> number one, photo ID. This is the, the biggest change to the law. So, you have to have photo ID that fits into one of four categories. It can either be a photo ID that comes that's your driver license. If you, you can also use a non driver license, but it, again, this has to be number one, not it. And it has to be two, Missouri, or a U.S. passport, or a United States government issued um, photo, photo, photo ID. Oh. Okay. Unexpired. All, un all unexpired. No, I think you meant that the name of the entity that the name of the person is registered. Yes. yes. That's part okay. of the same bill. Okay, okay. It's part so, of the same bill. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay, so, okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, 
for registering, and this is why Kenny gave this to me. If you, before as a volunteer, you did not need to register. Now you do, okay? And the League of Women Voters is requiring all of its members that engage in voter registration to submit this. And what we do is we fill it out, and you have to fill it out, you have to send it to the Secretary of State, and we are requiring that our members um, update that. But yes, that is, that is the biggest one. Um, the other thing that restricts, restricts us in terms of our voter registration outreach, you know, what we're asking people if they can, uh, if their registration is up to date, is that we can no longer talk about, encourage people to vote absentee. Okay? We, we, it, it, the word is, uh, there is, it is a crime to solicit absentee voting. Well, actually, it's a little more restricted than that, I think, because it's, it is a crime to solicit an individual to request an absentee ballot application form. So we can actually talk about absentee voting, but we can't solicit someone to request an absentee ballot application form, which is information that's readily available on the Secretary of State's website. But we're not allowed to tell you exactly where that is. That is written into the law. Joanne. Okay, Sandy. And So I can have that sign up there that says voter registration deadline is October 12th. You can register here. That's fine. So if we have any library staff who are not registered as women voters, who are not also uh, registered as solicitors, we have the forms in the back to show that that's the link. And we want to plug it in. But those people who no longer request, are you registered to vote? Not even allowed to do that. What so that's me. I can no longer ask anyone, are you registered to vote? Um, that would be illegal. I can't even really show up to vote this morning because I don't have a green card. So there are there's a lot of concern about that here at the library. So one way we've gotten around this is to have a frequently asked question on our voter information page, which is hey, I heard there's a new election law. Well, then how does that impact how I can register to vote or ask questions about voting at the library? And the election, the, Kansas, the election board and the Secretary of State's office have both reviewed the answer and said, yes, I know, this is fine. All you have to do is ask. If you know someone, you know, who's got a question, just say, you can ask at the library. Not everyone will be like, hey, you registered to vote, we can help you out with that. But if you have a question about it, you can ask at the library and anyone, including me, can help you. So that's, I don't know if that helps. Oh, it, it, it's tremendously helpful. Great. It, 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 yes, sorry. Will you tell people about our flyer page? And that we will have an information sheet about HB. The ones we talked about? Yes, and yes. that it's on yes. where it is. Yes, we will have on the League of Women and Voters website uh, flyers that will describe the legislation. House Bill 1878 that created these paint groups, which uh, includes both voter registration activities as well as the petition process. That's, we'll have that on our website yeah. with the annotation taking you back to the actual law. And and several other flyers as well, and that's at lwbkc.org slash flyer. Um, I have a question online just saying when will vote 411 be uh, accessible to enter your information to Okay, uh, okay, 
So October 17th, every, all the information will be live on vote 411. Stacy, please preview the 13th and the voter guide. But you can do it on the Kansas City Election Board now. Okay, well, I want to be, we want to be respectful of everybody's time. We will all still be here in case you want to ask questions afterwards. You've been a wonderful audience. You get the prize for some of the absolute best questions here in the secret we won't tell any other uh, areas but excellent questions she's got the form that the library gave out there will be judge retention um cuttings on the ballot that just gives you information on how you can get in and find information about the judges and the possible retention it um it, it comes through the missouri bar association and what they do is they have attorneys and other people will go through and do a whole way of, of asking questions and stuff, kind of get information about each judge and gives you an idea of what maybe copy book on what we want to be talking about. She's got the pamphlet right there. They call it the bar plan, but that's put out by the Missouri Bar Association. All right, again, thank you very much. And thank you for taking the time to be in court.